Hello and welcome to another Sales Hacker webinar. Uh, my name is Scott Barker, Head of Partnerships at Sales Hacker, and I'll be moderating an amazing panel lineup today. Uh, we actually have four guests for you. And uh, the topic we're going to be discussing is what B2B buyers really want you to know, but are afraid or maybe just too busy to tell you. Uh, so flipping the script and getting in the minds of, of buyers. So what we're hoping uh, to that you'll take away from this and, and what we're going to be discussing is we'll be covering how enterprise buyers in sales and marketing and finance source, research, and qualify potential solutions for their company. Uh, also covering the tactics and channels that really work to gain and more importantly, sustain their attention. And last but not least, we'll be running through what these buyers want sellers to know uh, about their preferences, maybe some of their pet peeves, uh, that can help improve uh, your future win rate, which is what we're all trying to do as uh, sales professionals. And before I introduce uh, my awesome lineup, a few housekeeping items. Uh, as always, this will be recorded. So if you have to jump in uh, to a meeting or you got to go and close the deal really quick, uh, go and do so. No worries. We'll be sending this uh, your way as we wrap up uh, in an email. Uh, and then the next point is we want you to get involved. So this will be a Q&A. Uh, we've got some juicy questions lined up for these panelists, but uh, we always like to hear from the community. So jump on. Uh, there's a Q&A feature at the bottom there. Uh, let us know your name, your title, uh, what you're all about, and uh, jump in with any relevant questions that you have. But now that we have that out of the way, uh, I want to make some introductions. And uh, I'm going to start uh, left to right here, uh, starting with uh, my friend Randy Bernard, uh, who is the VP of Sales over at Time Trade. Randy, welcome. Hey, thanks for having me. Glad to be here. We're, we're pumped to have you. And a little more color. Uh, so Randy is a 20-year sales veteran uh, with extensive experience in sales training, staff development, and recruiting. Uh, in his current role with Time Trade. Randy leads a growing team of sales pros uh, focused on net new customer acquisition. And previous to time trade, Randy led sales and marketing for a number of different startups, uh, including uh, Curata and ZMags, and actually ended up going on to found uh, your own national customer acquisition firm, uh, where you managed a sales force uh, responsible for, and this is crazy, for the acquisition of more than 175,000 new customers uh, for clients, uh, including the likes of Staples, uh, Monster.com, and AT&T. So just some small orgs. Um, and you're also, because that's not all enough, uh, the co-author of the Pocket Guide for Sales Survival, uh, 10 Vital Rules for Selling Anything to Anyone, Anywhere, and uh, also a highly rated uh, speaker. Uh, we've had... Uh, you on board uh, at a few sales hacker events and uh, on topics related to sales management, team building, and motivation. So very lucky to have you. Um, and then moving, moving forward uh, okay. in order here, uh, of course, uh, we have Natasha Fakat, uh, VP Corporate Sales at Panera. Natasha, welcome. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Great to be here. Awesome. Uh, and again, a little more color. So Natasha also has more than 20 years experience in marketing, sales, channels, and operations uh, in the IT hardware, software, and SaaS space. And in your current role with Panera, uh, you lead a team of more than 120 reps. So lots, lots of moving parts there. Uh, and it's focused on growing the company's uh, 200 million plus catering business. Uh, and some previous experience also includes roles with Click Software, uh, Turbonomics, and EMC. Um, so amazing experience there we're going to be pulling from today. And moving down the line, we have Steve Preston, VP Corporate Marketing at CyberArk. So we're going to hear from the, the marketing side of the, the house as well. Uh, so Steve, welcome to the Sales Hacker community. Hi, thanks. Hi, everyone. Awesome. And um, so you were actually named one of 100 most influential B2B tech marketers in North America by Hot Topics. That's pretty cool. And you have deep expertise in 
demand gen, product marketing, and, and brand strategy. And you recently returned to the security world to run corporate marketing at CyberArk uh, after building global marketing operations at QStream, uh, Aniqua, and Everbridge. And you previously held senior uh, leadership roles at RSA, Documentum, uh, Novel, Flash Silverstream, and Rational Software. Uh, so some amazing experience there as, as well. And last but not least, we have Andrew Gaffney, uh, President of G3 Communications and Editorial, Editorial Director of Demand Gen Reports. Andrew, welcome to the community. Hey, Scott. Thanks for having me. Awesome. Um, and like I said, so you're the Editorial Director and Publisher of Demand Gen Report. For those who don't know, that is a targeted e-media publication spotlighting the strategies and solutions that B2B companies use to better align sales and marketing in support of growth and revenue. So by the sounds of it, we definitely have the right people in the room or the, the virtual room to, uh, to be running through uh, this, this topic. And uh, we have a lot to get through. So let's dive kind of headfirst into this. Uh, and we're going to be starting by just setting the stage a little bit, you know, sharing a little bit of data, sharing some survey results to set the stage for this conversation. And Andrew, I'm going to, I'm going to pass the baton to you to, to set the stage for us. Yeah, thanks Scott. I think one of the things we want to share is some, uh, some survey data from our B2B buyer study. We've done that for about seven years. Um, some of the trends we see, um, it, what we've seen over the years is B2B buyers moving more to digital behavior, uh, especially early on in the early buying stages that the uh, digital and the marketing side is having more of an impact. So we see a really high percentage that start their journey um, on, on websites, on Google searches, looking broadly for, for topic areas and specific vendors. Uh, but we're seeing beyond that is, is behavior starting to shift a little bit more uh, to reflect um, you know, behavior that you'd see on the consumer side. So they're becoming very interested you know, beyond what what's, um, solution providers are available to know what their peers are, are using, what they're thinking, how, what their recommendations are. So we're seeing a big uptick in, in review sites uh, things like that. So you know, beyond sort of finding that roster of potential solution providers, they want to hear directly from peers about what they're using. Um, you know, following up on that, we're seeing much more of a influence for social media. Obviously, LinkedIn being one of the leaders in B2B, uh, we found over half that said they're relying more on uh, social media as part of you know, making their B2B uh, purchase decisions. So, um, you know, pr pretty, you can see some of the behaviors that they're doing there. They're following some browsing, you know, looking at discussion boards of, you know, what people are saying around certain topics. They're asking for recommendations right within their network. So did people use, you know, the solution? Would they be able to provide, you know, in, uh, insight about what their experience was like? And then looking for, you know, thought leaders within the topic. If there's an expert around the, the area, you know, what they might have written about it. And then finally connecting directly with vendors. Um, so you can see that, that the behavior is changing. Obviously, it reflects... Um, a lot of how they're interacting with sales as well if we move on to the next slide. So one of the things that we, we had early seen in the, in the first few years that we had done it was a real shift in terms of early stage buying was, as, as I said, becoming very digital. A lot of it was anonymous. Um, they were going onto sites. They wanted to, you know, be able to do to research sort of, you know, uh, above the radar um, you know, so, so that they didn't have to interact. They could gather a lot of information, be informed. Uh, what we've seen more recently is more of an agile buying behavior. They want all the information that they can get it when they want it. So there's some buying, you know, the, the uh, understanding or the, the knowledge that B2B buying typically takes a long time. You know, purchase decisions can take six to 12 months on average. But what we're seeing on, on this data is one to three months is really the sweet spot of when they're gathering and, and doing most of their interactions. And that includes sales. So rather than it being sort of a dichotomy of in the first three or six months, they're doing all anonymous research, they're really more influenced by digital, they're really taking every interaction point and taking advantage of it. And they're expecting and really sort of demanding that sales will be responsive, uh, that they're going to be able to get you know, whatever they need in terms of pricing, case studies. Um, so you know, it's definitely a shift beyond where it's you know, not one parallel or the other, but you know, they're, they're, they're really wanting to be able to, to get information when they need it, if a, if a buying decision becomes more of a priority within their organization, they may move that faster. So some you know, buying decisions may not take that long period of, of six to 12 months if it becomes a priority. And therefore, they, they really want their, their sales team, sales representative to be really responsive and, and sort of move to their needs. 
So you'll see if you click through some of the builds we have in here, that that one to three months uh, period is really the sweet spot. So rather than sort of becoming dependent or leaning on the, the knowledge of, well, it's gonna take a long time, we can nurture them. I'm really thinking about how to get sales uh, engaged earlier, uh, showing them as an expert. We'll see when we look at sort of what final decisions look like, how that, how that impacted them. So there's some builds there, if you could click through, um, just a couple of points on that. Again, that one to three months um, that they're, they're really already engaging with the sales rep, they're collecting pricing information really early, and they're accepting outreach. So it's not, you know, only talk to you after I've done all this homework. They're really willing to engage with salespeople earlier than expecting to. And then the next slide, as we looked at what, what stood out from the vendor you ultimately selected, there's a build in here that you, you could click through in a minute too, but um, ultimately it's really about the, which vendor demonstrated a strong, stronger knowledge of me as a company and my needs. So do you understand, am I a small company, mid-size? Do you understand what some of my pain points are? Have you expressed knowledge that you've solved that uh, with other vendors, with other clients? Um, you know, that you have a, a strong area of the business landscape. I think that's, you know, let's talk about consultative sales for years now, but I think that's becoming much more of an expectation and definitely much more of a decision point. Uh, timeliness was huge. A lot of the, the direct responses we got from, from B2B buyers, you know, they complained when things took too long that they would have liked to have seen a quicker response. So again, I think that the, the fact that sales are engaged earlier, sales are responsive to, to how quickly a buyer may want to move and responsive to what their, their different needs might be. So that timeliness factor we saw becoming a much bigger influence. Uh, and then ultimately, you know, we, we still see content being a really you know, big uh, influence at different points of the, the buying decision, um, and high, providing higher quality content, providing informational content. If you do the build there as the next sort of consideration though, uh, they want content, they, they wanna be able to access it, um, but they're really not expecting to spend a lot of time. So they want it to be very easily accessible. They want content that they can get through quickly, scan, skim, find out what they may want to share with their team. Um, a content preferences study we do separately show that a lot of buyers aren't willing to spend more than five minutes reviewing a lot of the content. So a lot of quick hit content, we're seeing you know, things like infographics videos that can be consumed on mobile devices having a much bigger impact on, on the sales cycle. And then in the next thing, when we looked at sort of, uh, you know, relevance, uh, you know, for content, relevance is really critical, but also for the sales representative. So when we asked, did you see the sales representative you dealt with was educated about your company and communicated relevant information, 91% said yes, that the, the company they chose ultimately did check that box. And if so, did it, did it uh, impact your experience and your decision on selecting that vendor? 83% said yes. So I think, you know, there was some discussion over the past years where maybe sales was becoming less influential, that buyers were self-navigating, and we saw that maybe five years ago. I think sales is getting back involved more at different stages and really having a bigger impact uh, and ultimately which vendor they decide to go with. That's all super interesting. Thank you for, for setting the, the stage there. And it just reminds me again and again, I, I do a lot of these webinars and it's so like there's no mention of, you know, product or service in there. You can really differentiate yourself now by your, your selling process and how good you are, are, are presenting. And I think now, you know, more than ever. Um, so that's, that was really, really interesting. And now I'm excited to uh, get everyone, you know, unique point of view, because everyone that we have on this panel has, has bought, you know, multiple or your buyers, right? So I want to um, actually go to you, Natasha, for this for this question. Uh, if you don't mind kicking us off, uh, how do you identify potential solutions for your company and team? Like, what does that look like? Uh, and then on, on top of that, what are your most trusted sources? Where are you looking to? Yep. So I think you know the the biggest thing, especially given the plethora of solution providers that are out there today, whether it's services or you know SaaS, everything is is relatively easy to stand up, and you can do pilots for everything, and it's really easy to get overwhelmed. And so something that I have sort of landed on over the past few years is really thinking through the technology stack and thinking through the roadmap of what are the critical sort of mission critical things that we need and is there a sequence in that needs to be followed as well, right? So kind of right. what is the bigger impact, less lift things, and then how do you progressively build? I think I made some mistakes earlier in my career of trying to do too much all at once. Um, and so I've learned that lesson. So it's really about building that, that roadmap, which means as a buyer, you know, you start to have a bit more power from the standpoint of, 
it, you know, you're not rushed. You're not trying to make a rushed decision. You have the time to really explore the options, understand the landscape and what's out there. And because there are so many options and because there's so much information as well, I, I find it can be pretty overwhelming. So for yeah. the, the most part, the types of things that I'm looking at is either my own prior experience so tools that I've used in the past or that I know, you know, other organizations have used um, trade shows and, and um, events and being able to kind of walk the tables and see demos and kind of understand a little bit around, you know, what's out there. But I would say kind of my, my real go to is peer reviews. And so talking to people that I know have recently deployed certain platforms or have recently used certain providers and and having those types of conversations around what's good what's less good you know how what's their view based on my use case and that that's yeah. really kind of how i've landed on this one yeah that makes sense so you're taking when you're identifying potential solutions you're really looking at this you're, you're putting together a holistic plan and then you're kind of shipping it away at it and you kind of almost you already know what you what you need really and you're just out there, you know, seeing the different options. And uh, so then if I'm a seller, it would be helpful. It would sway you if I served up peer reviews, like in my, my demo or, or right away. That would catch your attention pretty quick. Yeah, pretty quick. I mean, I obviously you're not going to tee up people who aren't giving you good glowing reviews. So I don't know yeah. that that would necessarily be the, the only way I would do my own independent. You know, I kind of think about it like if you're hiring someone, you're not always yeah. going to use their references. You're going to go to LinkedIn and see who you're connected to in common and call those people to find out, you know, the real story. Um, yeah. But certainly to me, that's more important, um, that peer reference and sort of someone who's gone through it versus yeah. a white paper or a canned demo or things like that, that wouldn't be as impactful. Yeah, that makes sense. So you're looking at the G2 crowds, the Capteras of the world as well to get a more uh, unbiased lens. Yeah, exactly. Like yep. Awesome. And Randy, I'm going to flip this one over to you as well. Uh, anything to add here around how, how you, you know, identify these solutions for, for your company at, at Time Trade? And where are you typically looking for your uh, sources of truth? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, the most trusted sources for me are people I know I already trust. So on almost anything I purchase, the first thing I do is I ask a handful of people that share the same title um, as I do. I know a handful of other VP of sales right in the Boston market uh, of other SaaS platforms. And so, you know, I'll reach out, although that typically runs dry pretty quickly. So then for right. me, Based on what Andrew said, you know, I agree. I go straight to LinkedIn. That's just me. I'll literally ask, you know, hey, how do you solve this pain? Or has anybody heard of this company? And I think once I've gone through the, the people that I know and trust, I then move to people I respect, right? So, you know, there are plenty of other leaders uh, um, around the software industry who I don't know personally, but I really respect what they're doing, what they've done, and, you know, why not follow in their footsteps, right? If they've got a particular tech stack, and that's how they're generating all their great results. That tech stack must be part of the solution. Um, mm -hmm. You know, so, so that's where I start. I, I go the opposite. Um, I stay as far away from the company I'm considering until I get close to a decision, right? So I'll just make one other comment. There's a B2B um, content consumers study that was done a while back, um, a survey on, on 400 uh, B2B content consumers. And one of the results was that third-party content is four to seven times more trustworthy than original content, right? Like if I'm considering a caterer, I know that Natasha is going to tell me that they have a great catering service. Of course, she works there, right? Like I know yeah. that that's going to be what she says. The question is, what does my aunt say? Or what does that other person who doesn't work there say? So a lot of times when sellers reach out to me first using third-party content, saying, hey, yeah. here's an unbiased study that said we're awesome or that you should consider this type of technology. That typically gets my, my wheels turning because I know it's, it's, um, you know, it's, more, it's more trustworthy to me because it's third party. Yeah, that makes total sense. So you're looking at the, you want to see the Forrester report, the Gartner report, and then that's going to pique the interest and be like, okay, maybe this is something I should I look into. Yeah, even a blog post that another similar company did, you know, that has no, not even a, a, an analyst, right? Just, you know, yeah. a lot of times these days, every company, every B2B company out there is searching for things to write about, blog about, tweet about. And 
a lot of times it's, you know, peripheral stuff. And so you can learn a lot by reading that. And, and once I hone in and, and I keep seeing a company pop up over and over again, then, then maybe I'll go look at their website or, you know, start to engage. But to Andrew's point, once I do, like, it, you, you better go quick. Like, if I get to my yeah. point in the buyer's journey where I'm ready to engage, you better be there yeah. when I need you, ready to rock. Uh, you know, the same way I can order a movie at night and in less than a minute be watching it in this on-demand society. Once I am ready yeah. to engage with a seller, you better be there when I need you. Yeah. Absolutely. That makes sense. And, and maybe on a, a community like a sales hacker, you know, I think that's part of the reason we've, we've had success this, this <laughs> third party, uh, you know, just ideas and bring new, new, uh, new things to light. That makes sense. Um, Randy, I'm going to take that one step further, actually, because you mentioned something where you're crowdsourcing, crowdsourcing information on LinkedIn. I think there's a lot of confusion around like social selling and how people should interact with you. Um, Cause I see this all the time. There'll be a, you know, let's say you post about, hey, I'm looking for a new data tool. Um, what's the best one out there? And then every AE from every, you know, data service is going to come on and be like, eh, we're the best, we're the best, we're the best. Uh, does that ever work in your opinion? And, and what would your advice be if, let's say I have a solution uh, for you, um, how should I approach that on, on a social platform? Yeah, it's a great question, and um, you, you know, be careful what you ask for, right? <laughs> when you post on social, you got to anticipate what you just said. I'm gonna, yeah. I'm gonna um, frame this a little bit differently, Scott. It, you know, mm -hmm. since this webinar is designed to improve the future win rates of sellers, I'm gonna give yeah. some advice to all the sellers out there that might be listening. Perfect. I think that you should familiarize yourself with the buyer's journey. If if this is the first time you've heard that term, or you're not really, you don't really like totally understand the journey that a buyer goes through, go read about it and learn about it because it's going to exponentially increase your win rates. For instance, there, you know, there's a lot of different companies and places that define the buyer's journey. There's the awareness stage, the consideration stage, the decision stage. But there's, there's times when myself as the buyer, I'm focusing on the problem I have. At other times, I'm focusing on the solutions. At other times, I'm trying to validate value or the return on investment. At other times, I'm, I'm almost at the point where I'm committing to change. So my advice to answer your question, Scott, is if you're yeah. the seller, try to figure out where I'm at in that journey. Because if you don't, you're going to miss the mark totally. Like if I'm, if I'm looking for real bite-sized information at one stage and you send me a 30-page ebook, you've missed the mark. And one example right. of this was – I'll just give you one example and I'll stop – I got an email just today, and the email, I'm not going to tell you who it's from, but the, um, the subject was, are you looking for a dialer, question mark. That, I mean, you don't have to be a magician to send me an email and know that I just happened to be looking for a dialer. Then down in the body of the email, it said, it said are you looking to increase your cold calling effective, effectiveness by 3x? I would have reversed it to you. Right. I would have had right. the subject line say, are you looking to get your reps better at cold calling? Because then I might nod my head and then in the body yeah. tell me that it's a dialer. But if I weren't doing this webinar today, I probably wouldn't even have opened the email because I wasn't looking for a dialer. I don't even know exactly all the different problems that dialers solve potentially. So my answer is make sure if you're going to sell in social and take those approaches that you have some framework for understanding the different stages of the buyer's journey I may or may not be in at that time yeah. so that you're more effective. Great advice. So almost map your approaches to the different stages of the buyer journey as a seller. And the different types of content I might be ready or not yet ready to consume. That's exactly yeah. right. Awesome. Awesome. All right. So let's, uh, let's move on here. Um, and Steve, I'm, I'm going to put this question your way and I'm going to quickly caveat it. This is not a, uh, an, uh, an invitation to, to cold call Steve, but, uh, Steve, what does it take to get you on a cold call? If, I, if I'm calling you right now, what's going to make you take my call? Um, nothing. <laughs> <laughs> it's very hard to get me to take it, – it's very hard for you to get me to take a cold call. It's almost um, – I'd say it's accidental. You know, it used to be the local dialing would um, would get me to pick up once in a while, but – you know, I, I do, you know, we might get into this a little bit later, but, um, mm -hmm. and I think the panelists will agree, right? Um, I, I'm extraordinarily busy. 
Yeah. So to, but, but, and everybody knows that, you know, if you're calling a senior person, they're really busy, but what you have to consider is that when you, when you cold call me, you're calling someone who's really busy. I'm not really in the mood to talk. (laughs) I'm I'm on my way to something. I've got a million things on my plate. I don't want to talk to anybody. I need to get to my next thing. I've, I've, or my plate's already overflowing with things to do. So, um, very, very, very difficult for, for me to take a cold call and, and God help the poor person who gets through and don't call my mobile by the way. But if you do get through and you get me on my mobile, it, it's just, um, it's, it's very, very slim. It's interesting too, because, um, I've I've built and run a few inside sales teams myself, right? And in the, in the, it's like a dirty secret, right? It was like you got to hit your 80 calls a day or whatever magic number of calls a day, and this many touches and this and that. And you know it's a numbers game, but it really, really is a numbers game because I think it's very, very difficult to get a senior person to pick up the phone and take a cold call. I don't think there's any magic. I would say the only thing I'll go back to what um, what was mentioned before. If if someone started to deliver value to me through social channels um, and they sort of got my attention and through that they timed their timing was right where I was actually looking for something then then you've just increased your odds dramatically right but you're, right. you're certainly I'm not thinking of a new project I'm not thinking of what technology you know I'm you know yeah if I'm going to go to, if I want to learn, if I'm going to go to a show or something like that, I'm not buying, I'm learning. And mm-hmm. that's all I want to do. So I think if you, yeah. if you, if you were lucky enough, or if you did your homework enough to, to kind of connect with something that I'm interested in and I could read it first, then maybe I'd take a call. Right. So that's, that increases your chances slightly. If you, if you put out some relevant content that catches your eye and then follow yeah. up uh, that with a cold call. All I'd right. say so. Yeah. Sounds good. I, I, and I, think, I love this question. So yeah, I, I would love to hear everyone's opinion. Natasha, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, you know, I think just to kind of piggyback on this, when you're selling to an executive level, you have to play the long game, right? And I think, unfortunately, when you even see the words cold call, you're thinking transactional, you're thinking blitzing, right? Like one and done. And yeah. mm-hmm. these days, with the amount of information that you can self-serve, like there's no way playing a short game is going to work with an executive. And so, you know, some of the better buying experiences that I've had are where you have sort of the respectful sellers that understand to Randy's point where you're at in the buying journey. And instead of being like, I know that you don't have this on your tech roadmap. However, (laughs) let's go through these 25 steps. It's like, no, I'm not going to go through, but thank you. Right. You know, and it is said that look at it as I'm going to plant seeds. Right. So when this time comes, you know, do you ever foresee an opportunity for this type of, of service? Yeah, I do at some point. Okay, great. Well, let me just plant a couple of seeds now and I'll follow up with you in a couple of months. Right. And so there's actually been some sellers where I'm the one that has initiated 18 months later, you know, 12 to 18 yeah. months later, I've initiated the sales campaign because the time was right. They were respectful. And honestly, you know, they earned my business, right? Because they positioned themselves in the right way. They added value to my process, my education, you know, versus others that have tried to sort of push the buyer's journey along. And it's like, no, that's my journey. I'm the buyer. You know, usually I'm the seller, but in this case, I'm the buyer. So it's my journey. I'm going to decide, you know, the timetable. Totally. I would, I would agree with that 100%. I know when I am in the buyer situation, I'm kind of the, the buyer that you hate and, and love the most because we'll do, you know, a demo and if it's good and it's relevant and, you know, you've come to play, then I'll, I'll mark you down on a list. And, you know, when the time comes that I need that solution, you'll be the first on that list. And then I'll, I'll call you up at the, the end of quarter and you'll be super happy because he definitely didn't expect me to come in and then I'll, I'll have done all my research and then we'll make it happen. So I would agree that, um, don't try and push your journey onto the buyer because it's just not going to work. Uh, Randy, anything uh, to add from, from your end? 
Yeah, I think um, I think we're going to talk later in the call, so I'll hold most of it. But I, I just say the yeah. one thing that will make me never get a cold call from you is if you employ and, and do those kitschy, tricky things that people do. Those just rub me the wrong way. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I think I think most people are, are good. You know, by nature, they're they're good. They're empathetic. And so if I see someone taking a real honest approach to try to get get in touch with me and provide value, then sooner or later I say to myself, wow, this, this gal's trying really hard. I'm going to give her a shot. But if, if they're not, if they're doing all those, like giving me multiple choice questions about whether a file cabinet fell on me and that's why I didn't get back to them. Or like if they're saying, you know, um, years ago it was show me and know me. Like, you know, that is so easy to see through, right? Because someone goes out, they say, hey, I know you wrote a book. I know you work at time. I know this, this, that. You know, maybe it should be show me you know the pains I'm going through. Let's advance mm -hmm. that to the next level. Don't just show me you know me because that's easy. Yeah. That's going to take you two seconds, and I can see right through it. But show me you you know what what I'm struggling with, to Steve's point. Show me you know how busy I am and respect that by saying, hey, oh, my God, thanks for picking up the phone. I know you are busy. This will take 10 seconds for whatever it is. So I would take a cold call from people that don't try to – swindle me or play games with me and they're just honest, respectful. That's, and the only other thing I would add is, um, and I think Steve said this before, there's got to be some brand recognition. I, I have to have seen you around or your company around a little. Like maybe I saw you liked a couple things over here first, right? You've added some value. Maybe sent me something without asking for anything in return, literally a selfless act of education or consulting. And then eventually I get around to the place where I, where I say, you know, I like that guy. I like that gal. You know, and I will actually engage with you, like Natasha said. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I, I want one quick comment on this too. I think everybody on the panel either sells or buys or both, right? Which means we all know all the tricks, and we've actually trained people on those tricks. So every email, every call, every script, everything they do, we're like we've we've already done it. So if 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 a BDR gets me on the phone and won't stop talking, I know they're just going to try to like overpower me and just keep me on the phone. And um, and what I'll do is tell them to stop talking, right? And and I'll just shut them down because I know because I know what their objective is. It's just if you, you know they've been trained. If you just keep that person on the phone for three seconds and da da da, you get you know you get your foot in the door and yada yada yada, right? Mm -hmm. And Randy talked about all the the the. the the tricky little emails and up my mail my mailbox is full of them. You may as well you may as well put you know what would get me to click through on a on an inbound email too because mm -hmm. I'm not going to do that either. Um, yeah. You know so 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 we're we're extra critical and what I have what I've trained some BDRs to do and and I, I don't think I've really had a BDR do this to me um, and I think I'd stay on the phone is if they're just human. And what if they said. I'm a BDR, I'm really young and I'm just starting out and this is really hard for me or something like that. I, to be honest with you, I, I, I am a human being and I'd be empathetic enough to maybe give them a shot. Okay, let me, let me hear what you have to say. I may not, you know, I'm not going to stay on the phone with them for, you know, 15 minutes. But um, yeah. when, I get, when, I, when, I, when I get that full force BDR, you know, ISR cold call thing, uh, yeah. It, I don't think anyone's really receptive of that, but I think for a marketing person who who buys or a seller who buys, right? Um, I think there's that extra dimension that's kind of interesting. I think there's I there's to, also oh, that yeah. sort of like professional um, respect thing too, mm -hmm. right? So like mm -hmm. you respect someone who has mastered the sales craft, right, or the or the the, the marketing craft, and so what what I find myself doing kind of the the opposite a little bit is if someone has earned the right. I mean, I lay out, I do full medic for them. I do the full qualification form. I'm like, it's less painful for me to have you ask me the question. So I'm just going to tell you, this is how you should forecast it. This is, these are the decision criteria. This is who needs to sign off on it. Like, cause I saved myself two hours of calls, you know, by just laying it out there, you know, provided I'm not giving away negotiating leverage, of course. Right. But, but outside of that, I feel like it is, it's, it ultimately it's a human thing. And if you know that you're selling to maybe an IT director, it's a little bit different, but specifically for, I think our experiences as sales and marketing leads, 
we know all the tricks. So don't, don't try the tricks. Like we wrote the tricks in a lot of cases, I think, right, Brandy, I'm looking at you. Um, you know, so it's like, it's, it's not worth it. It doesn't come across as authentic. And really it's about understanding your buyer. It's understanding where they're at and then providing, you know, kind of meeting them in the middle with the best, the best value. Mm. Yeah. Great, yeah. One, great one point. thing just to, to add, sorry there, Scott, I saw a statistic recently, I'm sorry to do this to you, I, I don't remember exactly what it was, but it, it talked about how if you provide air cover first with an email so that they at least recognize your name or your company name, by the time you make that call, you're, they're like 10x more times apt to listen for a second. And I really want to um, um, uh, agree with Steve. I've given people this advice too, and I don't know if they've taken it, but if I were a BDR today and I called Scott right now and he actually picked up, I just say, hey, Scott, I, I, you don't know me. I know you're busy. You weren't expecting this call. Can I just tell you one sentence about what we do? And you can tell me if we should ever talk again or never talk again. Fair? Mm -hmm. Like I'd ask for permission. And I'd, and I'd also put the control in his hand. I'd say, you can tell me after one or two sentences if we should ever talk again or never talk again. And in the event that you want to talk again, we'll schedule it for some other time because I know you're busy. You know, it's like I try to empower the people I would sell to, not – what Steve said, like take power from them or bully them. I just, 20 years ago, I was taught that people buy from people they like. If That's really the most fundamental thing I think any seller needs to remember is people buy from you mostly because they like you, right? There's a million options out there for everything. There's a million options. You Don't ever forget how important it is to be liked along the way and not start out that relationship in a dishonest way with like, that RE, like you're replying. I've seen people send me their first email letter, but they make it look like um, they're replying to something. Like, what a dishonest way to start a relationship. And there's a dozen other things like that that salespeople do, and it's a good way to turn me off. Absolutely. And Andrew, anything to add there? Do you ever pick up cold call? Yeah, I think that it's been said really well by, by the other panelists, but I think quick you know, points to recap. I think relevance is key, respect is key, and, and real, being real, authentic is, is key. So the points they made, if they're like, hey, I'm going to do BDR, uh, just some human element of this is why I'm reaching out. The one that, that stuck out to me, we were, I think, in the middle of, a, when we started the company, we were in the middle of a three-year lease, and I had a commercial realtor reach out to me and say, hey, would you like to know the average lease other companies of your size are paying in the market? I hadn't even thought about it yet of what we, you know, what we were paying versus others in the market. That was valid valuable information. And it was about a 30 second call. He followed up, you know, with the information and later led to a dialogue. So I think that's, if you can get that kind of, uh, you know, thing established really quickly, I think that's what uh, executives need. Absolutely. And uh, we've got a, a few gr great questions from the, uh, the community here. So uh, one, I probably know the answer to, but if we can quickly go down the panel and just a quick yes or no answer. Um, RJ Hamill from Skywalk Group. RJ, thanks for the question wants to know how likely is the panel to listen to a voicemail? Um, Andrew, yes, no. Maybe that's the real short. <laughs> okay, Natasha? Uh, typically no, but I do use them for training purposes. <laughs> so be forewarned. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Steve, yourself, voicemail, no. Uh, not listen, but um... They come through, you know, through my inbox now, so I might, I might take a look and read the first sentence, okay. too. You get them transcribed? Yeah. Okay, cool. Randy? 0. 0.0. 0. <laughs> all right, good to know, good to know. Um, all right, so we touched on this a little bit. Uh, I think, Natasha, you gave us kind of uh, a look at some of the, the better sales experiences that you've had. Uh, Steve, I want to get your perspective on this. Uh, what are what have been some of the best sales experiences you've had as a buyer, and and why? What made them stand out? Um, all right, I, I have a good one. Actually, um, who has it talked about a dialer? It was either Randy or Andrew. Someone talked about dialer. Randy. Um, so this is a this is sort of a before and after, right? Because it's it's actually a dialer, and I had two experiences. So one was early days when there weren't a lot of dialers on the market to call it like 2000, I don't know, you know, several years ago. Right. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I was putting, I was putting that system together and I had, uh, two vendors, um, two back to back calls. Let me put it that way. Um, 
uh, new technology. It was it was new technology. Well, relatively new technology, like B two B dialers, was a, a pretty relatively new concept. Mm -hmm. uh, vendor A jumped right into in there. You could tell it was a you know as the founders were talking to me. It was a startup. It was a technical crew, and they jumped right into let let me tell you why we're different. You know, we're we're native sales force, and that means this, that, and the other. And uh, so needless to say, that call didn't go well at all, right? Because uh, not only were they, um, uh, well, di frankly, disrespectful and very technical, and all they cared about was them and their competition and why they were better. They didn't take one second. So I stopped the call, and I said, um, I said, why don't you why don't you stop talking for a second <laughs> and listen to what my business problem is, and then we'll restart the whole conversation. So they basically wasted 20 minutes of my time, and I'm not even sure they knew what my role was, right? So that was that was bad way. Uh, good way was uh, very solution oriented. Now this is earlier in the market, right? So they were trying to, you know, and I had I, I was pretty clear on what I needed, what my metrics needed to be, what the volume needed to be, you know, and that sort of thing. And they they collected my requirements. They only addressed what I needed. They didn't try to oversell or upsell. Um, mm -hmm. And that was a very good call. And they gave me, you know, good content and good guidance. And I would say that the transition over to an account, well, I did the deal with them and I have told that story many times. Um, mm -hmm. And they transitioned me over to an account manager really well. So fast forward up to last year, right? So now there's, there are more players in the market. The models changed a little bit. Same vendor, uh, different challenger, right? Same vendor uh, selling to sales and marketing people. The sales rep wasn't prepared. He wasn't enthusiastic. You know, it was, it, and and keep in mind, like when a sales rep is selling to sales reps or people in, or marketing, not only are they, are they ripping you for being unprepared, they're ripping you for the quality of your slides, how good the demo is or bad the demo is. They're giving you bad style points if you're not delivering it, you know, your presentation professionally, right? Mm -hmm. So, so the so different criteria. Um, I didn't have to be listened to. I knew what my solution needed to be. I was really comparing technologies. It was a little bit more mature. It was a little further down the buyer's journey, if you will. Um, but different style points. So, you know, I think if you put the two together, <laughs> you know, the, the people who won not only uh, were superior listeners, and I always use spin as my kind of framework for listening, that getting right down to the implication and needs payoff, um, but being prepared and being professional, right? And, and the follow up and that sort of thing. But um, those are, the, that, that would be my criteria for a good call. And, Versus back, I'm a stickler for um, being heard. <laughs> Everyone likes yeah. to talk about themselves. Nobody more than me. Trust me, <laughs> right? But um, but people, you know, I I want to focus the conversation on what I need, and I don't I don't want canned stuff, and I don't really want to even talk about features and functions until we're on the same page. Yeah, that makes sense. So have some pride in your delivery. Style points matter uh, when when selling into sales and marketing, and then you know shut up and listen, and then you yeah. know, approach it solution selling is is essentially the name. Yeah, and and I think I think this we, we touched on this earlier. I think the the criteria changes. I think a little bit. Uh, you, you you guys talked about the buyer's journey. I think the technology and how you, you should be, if you're selling technology that's early, that's a, that's a, you're kind of a visionary technology and you're selling to visionaries, that's a yeah. different experience than something that's a little more, let's say early majority or late majority, something that's a little more established. You're going to get different criteria and different behavior. So I've been on the other end of that where there really wasn't a solution that could really quite do what I wanted to. And at that point I, I was in discovery mode, but I just wanted to see what the product did and mm -hmm. and have discussions but i didn't want someone to solve my problem necessarily so i think again hearing hearing where the buyer is at and what they're trying to do right first right up mm -hmm. front i think you'd be able to gauge you know with not only you know what problem they're trying to solve but where they are in the journey and you know what what makes them tick um yeah. is would it all makes for i think a successful call absolutely and that kind of ties back to what randy was saying at the beginning of this uh this 
this discussion here about, you know, mm-hmm. at the different different ends of the, the buyer journey, you're going to have to serve up a different sp- experience or different pieces of content to, to get heard. Mm-hmm. Um, awesome. So, um, Natasha, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shoot a question over your way here. So, we've all heard stats about how, you know, buyers are engaging with sales teams later and later in the, the sales cycle. Uh, yet some people still counsel reps that they need to do more education and, and problem solving and less selling when working with prospects. Uh, where do you come down on this kind of debate? Um, and when you are engaging with the sales rep, do you in fact want to be sold to, or are you looking to just be educated and you'll make your mind up uh, one way or the other? Yeah. I, so I'm going to totally punt this because I, I think the answer is it depends <laughs> because yeah. um, sometimes I want to be armed to sell my hierarchy on why a product, right. Or, or like why a technology and why that company, like I, so to a certain extent I need to be sold to because I need to know what are those nuggets that, you know, I can use to say, this is why we have to do this. Right. So yeah. it, it, it's not necessarily selling me on things, but more sort of arming me to take things forward. Um, but sometimes I do just want to get educated because it's maybe a space that I know two years from now that we'll be ready to invest in. We're not there yet, but I just want it to get educated. Um, I think one of my funnier experiences that, that has happened since being at Panera is I actually reached out. There's a, a, a section of technology that we're looking to invest in, and I had used a, a competing technology, but someone on the working group had used this one company's technology. So I personally filled in the online form, you know, and it's like VP of sales, like da da da. So I get a call from the BDR, and basically they were like, Yeah, we're not going to demo this for you because my sales rep doesn't think you're qualified (laughs) and I'm like uh I'm sorry what (laughs) like let me walk you through the background of how you fit into my tech stack and how I'm thinking about this and what we're gonna do and it's like well I'll try to convince him that you know he should spend 20 minutes on on a demo with you I'm like okay yeah you let you let me know that right and the next four companies I go to, you guys will never make it onto the vendor list. Like, so thank you, you know, for your time. And and so I think it it comes back really to Randy's point around understanding the buyer, right? Like you Mm -hmm. you need to understand. And so depending on which technology or service we're talking about, I might be in the final decision phases and I just need you to arm me with those couple of nuggets, or I might be super early phase of just thinking through how we're, you know, cutting edge companies thinking about this or working on things. And if you don't know, then you're not adding value to me. And there might be some, you know, different examples of things that happen moving forward. Yeah, that, that makes total sense. And that's, I, I can't believe we still live in a world that <laughs> you had to sell someone on the fact that uh, you were qualified. That's, that's wild. Um, Randy, are you looking when you're out there, you want to be educated or do you want someone to, to sell you on this, on something? Yeah. Yeah. You know, um, I'm going to go back to what Steve was talking about a moment ago. Um, I don't know why sellers make it so difficult, right? Like, like I was taught at an early age, my grandfather taught me you have two ears and one mouth and sellers out there, you should use them accordingly, right? Listen twice as much as you speak. I saw a statistic recently that the best discovery calls have something like 14 to 17 questions. So, you know, I don't, I think a problem we have today is sellers feel like anytime they get someone with a, a pulse on the other end of the phone, it's time to sell, 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 sell. That, there is, it, the chances that the person that happened to pick up the phone or that you're engaged with are actually your ideal customer profile in market, have budget, the chances are so slim. It's not time to sell yet, right? So if I were an AE today, Back to what we said before about just being honest, I might say, hey, Natasha, um, here's what I want to do. I just want to ask you like a million questions because if I can determine on this first call that, that I can't help you, I'm going to spare you and let you go, right? So I'm sorry, I'm going to ask you a lot of questions. Do you mind? It might feel like the third degree. That's the way I might approach it. Or to this question you're asking now, do you want to be sold to or educated? Hey, sellers out there, whatever happened to asking your prospects what they want to do next? You know, the person Natasha was just speaking about, 
their leader, their sales leader clearly told them, you have a process, you must run your process, never stray from your process. Like that is so old school. You know what? Mm-hmm. If I'm selling to Natasha, I want to ask her, what, how can I help? What can I provide to you at this stage? Do you want me to sh- show you a little high level look? Do you want me to ask a few questions? Do you want to ask me a few questions? You know, this is a two way street. So Scott, you know, there, there's an old saying that says, you know, contrary to popular belief, People actually do like to be sold to, but only when they're in the hands of an educated, trustworthy, consultative salesperson that is a good listener, right? So I think um, those people out there that, that keep giving sales a bad name by doing all these things they're saying not to do, shame on you. It's just, it's people, right? So there's my answer. I, I, I want different things at different parts of the stage uh, selling or buying presses, and I don't want people to guess and bully me. I want them to have conversations with me. Yeah. Makes sense. Great. Great point. Show up, be authentic, and just ask those tough questions. How do you want me to engage with you? I like it. I like it. Um, Okay. So we've got about uh, 10 minutes or so left here, um, and I'm going to kind of combine two of these questions, and I would love to get a quick answer from everyone if we can. Um, And this will be extremely actionable for any sellers out there listening, which I know there's many. Uh, What specific pet peeves do you have when engaging with sellers and what should reps stop doing in 2019 immediately? And Andrew, I'll start with you. I think just anything canned, you know, a canned email, there were some examples of that, a canned voicemail, it just feels like it's the same generic thing you've said to 100 people before. I think it, you know, it's the reverse effect you want. It proves you're unauthentic. It proves you don't know me at all. So I'm just, that'd be my biggest one. Yeah. The burn bridges by any, any canned script, that's uh, that's not your style. Makes sense. And uh, Natasha. Yeah, um, Randy kind of mentioned this one before, but the no, I didn't get eaten by an alligator. No, you're not. <laughs> or chased Willis by a polar bear. Sense, talking to ghosts, like all you know. I I do get the the interesting aspects of breakup emails. So conceptually, I think there's a place for them, but not the hokey not the sort of borderline insulting that's going to turn people off from you. So yeah, uh, no, thank you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> awesome. Good to know. Yeah. That, that one email should have been dead so long ago. Um, Steve, what about yourself? What should people stop doing immediately? Um, I, I concur with all those things everyone said. I did say, don't call my mobile number. Don't do that yeah. ever. Um, uh, I, I think we covered it all. It's, it's, it's the, it's the canned stuff. It's the clever stuff. Um, it, it just doesn't, it doesn't work. I think, you know, uh, not doing your homework, um, just, you know, covering, covering your ground, getting your meeting and delivering the demo is, is not a good use of my time. So, mm-hmm. yeah, um, I think that's really, I it. would, Steve, would you, so no, no mobile. Do you encourage your reps to call other people's mobile? No, no, no. Right. Cause I just, it's not, not, you know, now more than ever with privacy, you know, privacy laws and there's more of that. It just, there's not, it's not worth it. I don't, I don't know. And you know, the panelists can chime in. I don't know anybody who wants to get a cold call on their mobile number. Yeah. that I didn't give them that just was like, all right, how did you get my mobile number? Right. That's my first question. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and then now take it off your list and don't call it again mm-hmm. is my second yeah. statement. <laughs> but also texting. I, I personally haven't gotten the prospecting text, but I know that mm-hmm. that's, I was reading about best practices. Everyone should send text messages now. And that just mm-hmm. sounds horrible. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I do think, uh, well, Sorry, I'm butting in. I do think it's okay when you're selling. If I was selling to you, Natasha, for a while, to ask for permission to use your text, I think that's a smart thing a seller could do. Yeah. Yeah. Because, yeah, once you give me permission, now I have the ability. Um, My my two cents on the overall question, Scott, if if you're going down the panel, is is first of all, um, you know, don't, don't make me read a novel when I don't know you yet. I encourage people to treat uh, email like text messaging. Like if you're going to send right. me the first email ever, it should be like one sentence there. You know, if you send me these big long things, like I don't even read them because I don't have time to Steve's point. Um, yeah. uh, so I would say, yeah, one of my biggest pet peeves is people that are too long winded or not one of my pet peeves is people that uh, don't know how to paste 
and match style or remove formatting. You ever get these emails that like half of it is in big font, the other half because it's just copy and pasting all day? And then, and then my tip to sellers would be, you know, if you're running late for work and you've got a big meeting at 9 o'clock and it's 8.49, do you ever pull over for vitamins? No. But if you're running late for a meeting, you have a raging hangover, sorry, or headache, would you pull over for aspirin? You know, people part with money to solve pain. So I'm just a big believer in trying to identify the pain. So if you're going to reach out to me the first time, don't say, are you looking for a dialer? Like I said before, maybe ask me whatever the, about if I'm experiencing that pain that maybe in a later conversation you would educate me on the fact that a dialer would be solved. So that, that's what's going to get me to stop and listen is if you can pinpoint something that is causing me a lot of anguish. Yeah. Great point. Those are, those are awesome. And thanks for the, the advice there. Um, and yeah, I would definitely stop for, for Advil if I was, uh, I don't know. <laughs> um, okay. So we probably have time for, for one more question and everyone who's getting engaged in, in the community. Thank you so much. Sorry, we're not going to get to all the questions, but I'm, uh, I'm sure if you shoot, Randy, a note on, on LinkedIn or any one of these panelists, a note on LinkedIn, they'll, they'll be happy to uh, keep the conversation going if you show up uh, prepared. Um, so do you, this is a question actually for, for Randy, uh, do you have any tricks uh, on finding out what stage of the journey the buyer is in? How do I identify that quickly and easily as a seller? Uh, you could ask them. <laughs> Are you, you know, just before we get started, the last thing I want to do, Scott, is start whipping out features and benefits. If you're like, you know, just at, like, what, where are you at? How can I help? Right? What do you want to know? What, you know, that, I mean, I didn't really put a lot of thought into that. There are ways, actually, you can tell. There are certain questions you can ask that will elicit certain, you know, uh, you know, responses that can help you pinpoint and map someone in the buyer's journey. Um, so to you sellers out there, go do that. Go research that. Ask. Yeah. Ask someone about their timing, right? That's great. That's great. Um, and okay, so here's another one. This is probably the last question. I'm going to shoot it over to the whole panel. I think it's a, a funny one. Uh, and having been a seller, I, I feel the pain. This is from Diana. Uh, Diana wants to know, why do so many C-suite professionals uh, ghost people? Meaning, why do so many C-suite professionals go go dark and we, we never hear from them or maybe we hear from them a few months down the line? Uh, Andrew, I'll, I'll start with you on that one. I think it's typically where we see changes, you know, either changes in the organization or changes in business priorities. You know, it's frustrating, I know, on the, the seller side of like, why wouldn't they just let me know? But I think when there's uncertainty within the organization and particularly if it's big uncertainty, their last priority is getting back to a salesperson. So particularly if they're in flux of like, you know, I'm not sure whether I'm going to move forward with this, they tend to just avoid it. So I, I would just say it's generally change. Makes sense. Natasha, Steve, anything to add there? No, I think that's I think that's right. I think back to some of the conversations we've had. If there's been a building of trust in, in the relationship, I will eventually get back to the person and explain what was going on about it. Just again, kind of the mutual respect thing. But it wouldn't be first priority. Like if there was a layoff or if there was budget changes or you know priority shifts. You know, the first priority isn't to get back to the sellers, unfortunately. Yeah, I could I could add some color to that. I mean, those are really good points. I think what um, sellers have to understand is that you tr you try you're building business plans. You're trying to get things approved in a budget. That stuff rolls up, you know, rolls up the chain of command, gets approved or not approved or postponed or whatever, and things are moving around. And I think it's important to know who you're calling on and how much flexibility they have in their budget. You know, if it's a manager, they don't have they get they get a budget, they spend their budget. That's it, right? Um, yeah. the, the higher up, the higher up the, the food chain you get, if you will, you have more movable parts and more cost centers where you can bother and move money around, but, but you're still dealing with someone who's trying to, uh, kind of work something internally, right? They might be really passionate about a project that might be all well and good. And the quarter turns, you know, Q3 turns to Q4, or what have you, and suddenly something gets deprioritized or moved. And, mm -hmm. you know, typically, right, sales wouldn't have any, any line of sight into that. So I think things can be more fluid. Um, the more senior, the more senior, you know, the, the person you are that, that, that you're calling on. How is that for a marketing communications guy? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I bought that really bad. The further on, the, you know, it's more fluid. There are more moving parts. It's more leverage for you potentially. But then, you know, things happen. Yeah, that makes total sense. Awesome. 
Um, all right. So we are, as we wrap up here, I, I do have to uh, give a huge, a huge shout out to Time Trade for uh, bringing this, this awesome panel together. That was invaluable. And uh, Randy, for those who maybe don't know uh, how, how Time Trade helps sales professionals today, uh, how are you guys helping sales professionals? Yeah, every I mean, there's no 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 sale can take place without meeting. So we basically are appointment scheduling, right? We eliminate the calling and the chasing and the waiting that goes on and all those valueless emails saying, "Hey, Natasha, want to meet? How's Thursday at three? We just buttons right in Salesforce, click, easy stuff. Nice. Speed up the sales nice. process. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, well, Randy, Natasha, Steve, Andrew, thank you so much for for all the insights. Uh, that was a, a really enjoyable conversation. And uh, to everyone who, who joined us in the community, thank you so much.